So as we get started, we can start off with introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Zoe Osborne. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an assistant director of admissions here at Penn, um, and I work for the state of Maryland. And I'll turn it over to Natalie to introduce herself as well. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Natalie Zamora. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior associate director of admissions at Penn. I read for uh, primarily California. So as we get started with our presentation today, um, I know that most of you are probably not with us here in Philadelphia, but I want to talk a little bit about where Penn is located. So Penn occupies the traditional homelands of Lenai Lenape. We acknowledge this to express gratitude to the indigenous people, past, present, and future for the opportunity to live and learn on Lenape Hoking land of the Lenape. With that, we will get started with our presentation today. Um, I hope that most of you are counselors or teachers or leaders of CBOs who are interested in learning a little bit more about writing letters of recommendation. Um, and we hope that we can provide some clarity and some helpful tips and tricks as we go through this process for all of your students in the coming year. Um, so our sort of event plan today for this, we're gonna start off with what we are looking for um, in a letter of recommendation, then we will get into some structuring of these letters, how you can make them easiest for us to read, how you can make them simplest for you to write. Um, we want this to be a win-win for all of us. And then also we're gonna close out with some tips for using an organized narrative format. Um, as Natalie mentioned at the beginning, this will be recorded. So you do not need to record it yourself. Um, if we are YouTube stars, we would like to do that on our own terms through the Penn Admissions YouTube channel. Um, so please don't record or upload any piece of this information today. Also, if you want to ask any questions, um, please utilize the Q&A box. We hope to get to some of those at the end of the session. And we also have closed captioning available for you. We'll start off with what we are looking for when we are reading a letter of recommendation. Um, they really comprise a lot of different things um, from you about your students. We want to know how the student interacts with other faculty members um, and as well as their peers. We want to know not just the quantitative pieces of who they are from their testing and their transcript, but the qualitative pieces of who they are in the classroom and in the school community as well. And this is really where you come in. Um, we want to know how they engage in the learning and curriculum available to them within the school. Um, so that sort of context of what curriculum is offered and how they've really pushed themselves within that context, as well as how they've impacted the community. Um, maybe what will the school look like without them there? How have they changed things at, in your school environment? Um, we also want to see how they've faced various obstacles and setbacks. We'll talk about later on sort of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing ramifications of that and how you can speak to that in your letters. But we want to know how they have faced these obstacles that um, they've gone through within their high school experience and how they've come out on the other side or how they're still facing those to this day. And then also how they sort of compare, compare to their peers throughout your career um, within their grade as well as prior classes that you may have worked with and lived in the high school. Now I will now turn it over to Natalie. You're on mute, Natalie. Thank you. I am on mute. Sorry, I also have a dog just in case that he goes off. I try to stay on mute when I can. Um, but getting into kind of the, the details of the uh, letter of recommendation, um, I think first and foremost in that introduction, there's so much context that you could be providing to us um, and acknowledging the fact that not every caseload is built the same. And I know we're gonna be talking, uh, we're in a room with people who uh, identify as high school counselors. There are some of you that are teachers, some of you who are um, assistant principals or who work at uh, nonprofit organizations. So you know these students in very different ways. Um, but, and so we're kind of speaking a little bit generally, but essentially when you're thinking about an introduction, you want to think about it in kind of three stages, introducing yourself, um, introducing the school or organization um, that you're in. If you're a teacher, maybe introducing what kind of class content that you cover, um, and then introducing the student themselves. Uh, and to varying degrees, you might know that student, but just 
giving us a nice thesis statement, something that really sets the tone is helpful. Um, for example, maybe that thesis statement is, um, you know, Zoe is that firecracker academic in the classroom. Boom. Doesn't have to be a long one. If you if that is that the uh, wheelhouse of that student, that's a good thesis statement. Or um, Natalie is a fantastic, you know, social justice kind of a kid and makes a giant impact in our campus community. Wonderful, you know, if, if that is the the core to that student, something that really shouldn't be missed um, when understanding that student more in a letter, that's a great thesis statement. And again, it sets the tone. You may also have a two part, right? Two, two clauses in that thesis statement. Um, they've overcome, you know, despite many challenges at home, they've really thrived in our environment. That's already setting me up as an evaluator to look for more context you're building around the home environment and more context that you're building around that student's um, perseverance. So all of that I think is to me very helpful. And um, what I think that like top part here, floodlight versus spotlight, sometimes in an introduction, it can be very easy to like totally zoom in on introducing yourself or totally zoom in on talking too much about the school or too much about your, you know, um, ex your, your experience at this at this institution. And then I don't get to hear so much about the student. Um, so really think about the way you're structuring that introduction and um, keeping the student at the at the spotlight while giving us good context about the environment that they're in. Moving into content, I think there's like three slides on content. So I just wanted to mention they're very word heavy and we understand. So if you want to take a screenshot or take a you know quick pick, feel free. Um, don't feel like you need to like memorize each of these sections here, but I'll kind of talk about each um, heading in, in general. Um, so thinking about, you know, you're past the introduction, you're going into the content. Um, how does the student impact in your community and what kind of ways you would describe their intellectual curiosity? The community piece, we are trying to read your letter and place this student, imagine them within our school context. So when you talk about the ways that this student has impacted the community at your high school level, we're thinking, awesome, like that's what they're gonna be like when they're here on our campus. So that's why those you know, questions about, are they a role model? Are they a leader? Are they someone who maybe takes more of a back seat? Um, all of those things are helpful to kind of build the image of that student. Um, intellectual curiosity, I think, is uh, something we grab onto as much as we can when we're reading letters of recommendation, um, especially as it relates to uh, what the environment is like that they're in. If they're really that standout academic star, tell us that. Um, I think more often than not, sometimes uh, it's easy to lean on their rank or lean on, you know, what percent of the class that they've achieved. That's just the snapshot, right? Those numbers are just the, the, the highlight reel. You're giving us the meat and potatoes in that letter. Like that's really what the letter is for. So I wouldn't lean so much on their rank number one. That means they're the best in the school. Really think critically about, is this the kind of student who will talk your ear off about Plato? Is this the kind of student who is always asking, I know you won't let, let me take that last, you know, that extra period of, of math, but can I? Like, I know you always tell me no, but can I take that extra honors class? What, you know, kind of intellectual curiosity are we understanding about this student is helpful to um, illustrate in your letter. Moving forward about peers, um, how do they interact with peers? And then how might you compare them to others in your school throughout your career? I think this can be kind of challenging, especially the comparing part, because um, whether you are doing uh, this letter or teacher evaluation or counselor evaluation through the Common Application Coalition, uh, Quest Bridge or a homegrown application, there's usually some kind of form that allows you to do check boxes. So you can rate, you know, how excellent is this student when it relates to faculty respect or quality of discussion. 
And I often find um, a lot of uh, faculty and counselors have trouble with that because are, am I thinking you know, of all time or am I thinking of within this class or within that particular class period? And I would suggest you know, that that is one literal way that you could compare here, but more so we're looking to understand the descriptive ways that you are contextualizing that comparison. So go with whatever feels comfortable for you when it comes to those rating sections and then explain in as much, much depth as you can why you see this student kind of fitting in the greater landscape of your school. I've had many counselors who are um, really upfront and give a lot of detail. Uh, for example, I've had counselors say, you know, this class in the last five classes, this class has really been super strong. They like more than anything, these are the kids who are super engaged and super academically, um, you know, academically strong. And in for this student, they're kind of in the middle of the pack, but had they been born a year later, they probably would be doing at the top of the juniors or the top of the sophomores. Um, give us that context, help us build an understanding of where that student sits again within your school, within their peers, but also kind of within your career. Um, how do they interact with peers? Are they, do they work well in groups? Are they more of an independent learner? Are they respectful of people's opinions? Especially nowadays when things can be very tense. Um, we're looking to, to understand the kind of bridge builder qualities of that student. And then the last slide on content that we'll talk about is um, focused on kind of the additional pieces that you're not really sure all the time how to squeeze into that letter um, or how to nimbly talk about some of these things. Um, and rightfully so, especially when we think about that first point of how has a student faced obstacles or setbacks? Every student, regardless of background, has probably faced some challenges in their life, whether that's personal or health related, family related, or the challenges that they're facing in the classroom, on the courtyard, et cetera. Um, these I think are really helpful to understand. I find that a lot of students like to portray often a squeaky clean image, uh, as, as best of an image that they can possibly um, put forward in an application, and then it kind of leaves pieces that maybe don't add up to that perfect image. So be the advocate for that student, be the voice for that student to say, hey, you know, you may not have noticed this, but actually something happened in their 10th grade that, um, you know, they've given me permission to speak on, and I think it's important to help contextualize the, the student. Um, you don't have to give us all the details. You, Really, you don't have to tell us much, but as long as we get a good idea of what that setback or what that obstacle was or is, perfect. And even more important is to focus on what that student did after that. Are they coping well? Have they reached out to different resources on campus or beyond campus? Do they have a solid friend group that has really helped them through these issues? Um, in our conversations that we have in committee or in our evaluation, we're often looking at, well, what have they done with that challenge? Not what has actually happened to them, but what have they actually done? So if you want to focus your letter towards that, all the better. Passing it over to Zoe. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some things that are really effective and some things that are less effective in these letters. Um, so first up, I'm going to talk about effective and positives. Um, so context is really, really important. Um, it's as Natalie talked about, like you all probably have different caseloads and that's a really important thing for us to get to know because um, if you have a caseload of 25 students, you might have really in-depth letters because you know your students really, really, really well. If you have a caseload of 500 students, there's just no possible way that you could know your students as well as that counselor who has 25, and that is okay, but that is also something that we want to know about. Um, we also want to know about the circumstances around that student's performance. Natalie just talked about setbacks, um, but if a student has, say, a dip in grades, we will see that on their transcript, and it's really helpful if there is some context around that that we can understand maybe why that happened. Um, 
and you really come in there. Um, we also want that like corroboration of what the student is talking about. Um, so if you can sort of uphold their materials and like let us know that everything that they're saying is what they did, um, that is really helpful for us as well, especially if there are any like pretty big accolades that they've received. Um, it's nice to hear that from you as well as from them. Um, and then we also want to see how that student has impacted the school community and um, what their strengths are, what their personal qualities are. Um, it's really nice to hear that from multiple people um, and not just from the student, but to see that they've really had that impact on people around them as well. And that's something that we can get from your letters. Um, and then having a clear structure makes our lives easier and I think probably makes your lives easier as well. Um, so starting off with that overview, we'll get into an example of a letter in a couple slides, but starting off with that overview, talking about how they are as a community member, talking about how they are as an academic and in the classroom, and then also who they are as a person, because um, in our info sessions, I always like to say that we don't want to admit brains on sticks to pen. We want to admit full people who have been nice contributors to their high school environment. And those personal qualities are a really great way for us to get to know a little bit more about who they are as a full and well-rounded individual. Um, I'll now talk about a couple of things that are perhaps less effective in these letters um, that you can maybe steer clear from. Um, form letters were something that we do see a lot and we totally understand um, that when you have that really big caseload, it is way easier to have a form letter. Um, if you do that, just please still customize it to the individual students. We want to learn something from that letter. We want to learn something unique to each of those students from that letter. Um, if you say, if we read one letter from a school that says that that student is the best in their class, and then the next letter also says that that student is the best in their class, it sort of takes away from the impact of either of those letters. Um, so we do want that praise to be individualized to each student and really uplift their um, individual strengths. Um, sometimes a quick proofread to catch if there is an incorrect name on a letter can go a really long way um, because if we see a letter that has an incorrect name, we no longer know if it is praise for that specific student or not. Um, so just really be aware of that. Um, and then those specifics um, on that individual student. And again, everything that we've talked about, who they are in the classroom, who they are in the school community and what their personality is like um, are all really great ways in which to be specific. Um, we, I know I talked a little bit um, earlier about like lifting up the really impressive elements of the student and corroborating what they've said. I know that this is sort of saying the same thing and not to summarize their resume, um, but you don't have to tell us every single activity that they're involved in. That is what the activity section is for and they have told us about that. Um, so you don't have to waste your space um, and your time with doing that. Um, course grades, same thing. We get those transcripts. Um, and then quotes from teachers, I think, it can be really nice to give an overview of how different teachers and how the faculty at large see the student. But if it's teachers who they are getting recs from, um, we will also get those recs. So we will see them. Um, again, you don't have to pull out quotes from those teacher letters because we also have those teacher letters. Um, and then in terms of these like hollow adjectives, um, so to sort of go back to the specificity, we want to know what really who this student is um, and some of these adjectives can really apply to a lot of students and don't give us that clear vision of this particular student um, because even if you don't know your students that well there probably is one or two things about each one of them that makes them that individual person in your eyes and we want to know those things about them um, instead of some of these adjectives that we might see a lot in a lot of different letters and don't tell us a whole lot about who they are as a person and what they could contribute to our community. And I just want to talk to Natalie to give us this more, a more specific example. Awesome. And also, by the way, already phenomenal questions popping up in the Q&A. Um, one that actually talks a little bit about the form letter um, that I think is applicable to this slide, actually. Um, how do you sort of go about giving yourself guidance and structure within a letter of recommendation without it being a form letter or too formulaic. And I 
kind of feel like the organized narrative is a best of both worlds situation where you get to have those guideposts, but you get to also fill in for each student what is unique about them. So in this structure, we have sort of subsections or subheadings that help guide the reader to what they might be looking for in a particular instance. So in any given time period in which we're reading an application, we may be reading that application and looking for certain things. So on the initial review, we're thinking, hey, I am really wanting to get just a good understanding, a good holistic understanding of this student. So I'm looking through each of those sections to kind of get that understanding. And I get to kind of step into, all right, now I'm understanding this student academically. Okay, now I'm understanding the student in their impact on campus. Now I'm understanding the distinctive qualities of this student, et cetera, and however many subsections you wanna create for yourself. Whereas if I was reading this student in committee, I've already seen that whole file. And now I really wanna to point to the academics. Okay, I know exactly where I can go, where my eye can go in that letter to recall back the exact things that I really loved about that student academically in that committee conversation with the chair and the partner and all the other things that all the other people in the room to so they can understand how amazing that student is. So it's twofold. It's to have these subsections, I think, is really helpful, both to understand the student as a whole and also for later in the process when we're really trying to look for little snippets, little sound bites that about each section that I can quickly say, this is Zoe Osborne. <laughs> um, I wanna say, even though you know we have a slide devoted to the organized narrative, any way that you write a letter is going to be okay. I, I uh, we, we talked about this in a, a few other slides, but not every counselor load is the same um, in a lot of uh, in a lot of high schools or even CBOs. You may have a you know a caseload of several hundred students, and you won't be able to have this much detail, or you might really lean on bullet points because you just don't have time, or even you don't send a letter at all, and that is all okay, that's all well and good, and we understand. Um, but if you do have time and you understand the student, we think, again, this is a best of both worlds sort of scenario where you can have the bullet points, you can have the subheadings to kind of help you generate ideas about the student and help our eyes understand where to look when we're thinking about that student, um, but also give you space to like flower it up and, I'm an English major, so I do love the extra prose and the wonderful fluffy writing. Um, that's just me, but I also love to find answers easily. So that's why we think it's it's a two for there. Um, I know I've already mentioned some of these things, but I do think that the this method is definitely a time saver because you're sort of asking yourself the questions up front for each student instead of saying, where do I begin? Every single time you're writing a letter. Um, and it's certainly easy on the evaluation side when we think about um, what information we need from that student at different parts of our timeline and process. Transitioning to some common questions. Um, one common question that we get is sort of what is the appropriate length for a counselor or a teacher recommendation? Um, I know that we have different roles here um, in the audience. And I would say that really by and large, a page is totally great. Um, you, one of the like beauties of the sort of bulleted format that we showed a couple slides ago is that you can fit a lot of information into a small amount of space and a small amount of words, which again, saves you time and saves us time, but also gets all of the relevant information across and makes sure that we are getting to know the student um, in sort of that more concise format. So a page is really totally fine. You do not have to go above and beyond a page. Um, it 
is really helpful for us to get to know that information as in as concise a format as possible. Okay, another common question. How can I write an effective letter if I don't know the student well? Um, and I know this has come up a, a couple of times even in the uh, the Q and A, and I think it's okay to not submit. I know that's not maybe the purpose of this presentation, but I, I want to put that at the front. It's okay to not submit a letter. Um, I believe there's even a, a description section that maybe you can include to say, you know, I, I don't have capacity to write a letter at this moment. That's all right. Um, if you don't know a student well, I think giving us context about the school can be helpful too. Not all school profiles, I know we haven't talked a lot about school profiles, but not all of them are built the same. So even your understanding of not just what the school offers, but how students tend to navigate the offerings can be really, really helpful. Um, if you know how that student has navigated the offerings, perfect detail. Um, you may not know, again, the ins and outs of that kid. You may not know their parents. You may not know their interests. Um, that's that's fine. Um, but if whatever detail you can give about the environment that they're in, I think can be really helpful for us to understand because you're just one of many letters, right? We're going to hear from the teachers. We're going to hear um, from the student themselves what they're interested in. So give as much as you can about the information that you know best, which for counselors is gonna be your school, for teachers, it's gonna be your class environment. Um, and it's okay It's okay to not know everything about each student. Um, we, we, the whole application is giving the image of the student. So we're not just relying on your letter. We also wanna talk a little bit about letters and COVID um, and letters and sort of hardship and different circumstances in general, um, because this is definitely something that you all can shine a light on. Um, so we not only want to know like how students have handled COVID or any other circumstances that have come up in their life, um, but also this is another opportunity for you to sort of like corroborate what students say about how they handle challenging circumstances or illuminate what they don't say. Um, again, Natalie mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, some students are very forthright about what um, they've gone through in their lives. And some students want to paint us that super pretty picture that everything is all fine and perfect all the time. And we know that nobody has that story. Um, so if it's OK with the students, if you know the students well in that way, um, this can be a really great way for you to just like give us a little bit more dimension about who they are when things don't go perfectly all the time. COVID is just a great example of that because it impacted literally every single person in the whole world in some way. Um, and it's just a nice opportunity for you to sort of show us how they respond to a challenge. Um, this is something that they were all put through. We were all put through this, um, but they may have additional challenges that they've gone through as well. Um, and letting us know how they respond to that is really great because more likely than not, more challenges will come up in college and in their future. Um, and knowing how a student responds to that is really nice. Okay. So those were some of the common questions. And I know we have a ton of folks um, and a ton of questions in the Q&A box right now. Um, and some things that I think could be uh, helpful to hear from even other people in our office. So helping us with the uh, open Q&A portion of the program is uh, our Director of Admissions, Jordan Pascucci, um, who will be coming on with us shortly. And um, actually, I think this page is a really good page to, to pause on too, because there are so many resources that are at your fingertips that are also very recently updated um, that Jordan can walk through a little bit and probably help answer some of the implicit questions that are that are coming in too. Yes, hello everyone. I'm really happy that we get the chance to kind of connect as you, and I'm so impressed to see you all here in August because 
having been on the secondary school side, I know exactly how precious your summertime is and that August comes around quickly. So I do hope that you had an awful lot of wonderful time to kind of recharge for the new year. And I guess, happy new year to all of us. Um, I am really happy to lean into a couple of elements here. In the coming weeks, you're also going to see some new blog posts from our Dean of Admissions, Dean Soul. You're going to see a newsletter and communication go out to you towards the end second half of August because there are quite a few new changes and ways that Penn has made the attempt to provide helpful guidance to students as they're actually filling out the application. So our hope here is to keep making more and more clarity of this process, clear, kind ways to lessen the stress. I see a lot of questions. There's two hot topics that seem to be. One is obviously around the recent court ruling and then the other, I see AI popping up. So AI, I will quickly address AI. That's perhaps the easier one, ironically. Um, and AI, I think that Penn in particular, you know, we've been staying in touch with a lot of our faculty, right? Because if I'm being honest and I think about my own experience in the secondary school world, I think that it's all of the educators that have the hot, far heavier burden um, when it comes to AI than it does for the admissions process. Let's face it, students always had a wide variety of input, help, assistance that they were managing when it came to putting together their thoughts and organizing them for the application. And AI is one of such tools, right? Is that we hope that any advice, input, assistance that students use they use it responsibly. They make sure that it doesn't take over and become you know, a replacement for their own voice and thoughts and experiences. But when applicable, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with students using things to help them organize their ideas, organize their thoughts, map out drafts, get thoughts to paper. But at the end of the day, <laughs> the same way that you know AI has created solutions potentially for students, it's also created solutions for admission staff where all we need to do is enter three sentences of an essay and with pretty good accuracy, we are told, we can be told the likelihood of AI having written that body of work. So <laughs> when it comes to teacher recommendations, I've actually also have had a few teachers reach out and sort of say, hey, you know, like I'm the only math teacher in the building and everybody always asks me to write a recommendation. Can I use AI? And same thing applies, right? Um, that whatever your trust and comfort factor is, I think that that's to each person to decide. But from Penn's perspective, same same advice that we would give for any sort of input or assistance or advice, and you know that people are receiving in this process is that at the end of the day, in highly selective admissions, especially. There's only one you, and the more that you water that down or dilute it or make it sound like someone else or generate content from other sources, the less it's gonna sound like you. Um, when it comes to the, so the court ruling, um, I think that the number one thing to, rec to, re to remember, right, is that the premise that we are all operating on for right now is that race and ethnicity can still be considered and are appropriate to be considered in the context of lived experience of direct experience and perspectives that you know have been part of a student's you know a student's life a student's background um, and everything that has occurred to them to date so still being able to share those things in their relevance of context right like when you're providing context to understand the skills, the qualities, the character development of a student, that's absolutely appropriate. Um, it's less about what you're able to say, the ruling, and more about how we're able to use that information in our evaluation and selection process. And so the burden really isn't sitting with you, it's not sitting with students, the burden is sitting with us and you know, on the admission side to be able to make sure that we are developing processes that allow us to have an equitable legal review of all files while at the same time not sacrificing 
the things that Penn and all communities of education and higher learning value, which is a variety of difference and perspectives. And so um, just, just know that I think that we're all challenged in exactly what that means this year. And that's why what my colleagues, Natalie and Zoe were sharing about the insight into your community, the insight into how these individuals have shaped and contributed to your community, the context that they might not be able to share in other parts of their application because they wanna highlight other things, but that you know has been important to their character development. These are all things that become incredibly worthwhile if you have that knowledge and you have that ability to share that on behalf of a student. Penn is not taking the approach of asking students to emphasize trials, tribulations, any of the adversities that, you know, a lot of that was part of the discussion when the, when the court decision was released. At Penn, we still have our three short answer responses. One is where students are going to answer a question about the undergraduate school or program that they chose. It's a short answer response. The other is asking them to connect with Penn through the idea of community. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And then the third and the first question that they get asked is still the gratitude prompt, right? So we want you to take a moment to express gratitude to, to someone you might have not had the opportunity to properly thank. And we hope that they share it. The real reality of why we ask that question is so that all applicants can experience the wellness benefits that come from the expression of gratitude, as well as put them in the frame of mind to really have, have a, the, you know, the positive psychology moments of being able to see their life, their potential, their aspirations through this moment of gratitude. And we hope that that sets them up then for responding to the subsequent short answers. When it comes to connecting with Penn through the lens of community, we are making, we've, it, we've done a couple of things this year that we started to do last year, but we expanded on this year. And that is embedding live links into the supplement in real time so that as students are filling out the application, if something isn't clear to them, they get to click on the link in the question and get that explained to them. Why are we asking this? What are pages they might wanna check out? What are resources at Penn they might wanna check out to help them answer this question? We hope that that goes a long way in students not only choosing the best match academically for them at Penn, but also inspiring them to make those meaningful connections of community, helping them see themselves as belonging at Penn and sending the signal that Penn values a variety of experiences, backgrounds, and um, perspectives when forming a class. So these are some of the, you know, the, the, the things that I wanted to lift up that are kind of related, but I think we can go to some of these more specific questions, because I want to make sure that <laughs> what's most on your mind is getting answered during this time that you're with us. Yes. Um, thanks, Jordan, for mm -hmm. all of that information. And again, um, I, I really, really do recommend you take a look at our website. Um, it's got all of those details about the changes in our application um, right, you know, right there for you. Um, something that popped up in the chat that I want to, to take a stab at answering was related to um, CBOs, so nonprofit organizations um, that have, uh, that tend to have a kind of a smaller caseload and um, the ability to write letters for students by choice, essentially. So whereas a counselor letter every student is going to require some kind of a counselor letter, even if that means you check, no, I will not be submitting a letter, a counselor will need to fill out a form. For a CBO, it's almost like a teacher letter or an additional letter, right? A teacher has the right to say, no, I won't be writing that letter or an optional letter or um, you know, maybe a coach or something could say, I really wanna write a letter for you. Can, will you accept? A, you know, a letter from me for your application. So the question embedded is sort of, how do you decide which students to write a letter for if you have the choice to do that? Um, and I think you 
are within your right to just just as a teacher would be to say no to students who are asking you to write a letter and you're not really sure how to even write a letter for that student, feel free to say no and the student can move forward with um, other people that they want to ask. Uh, in, in another world and kind of the world that this question is painting, if you have a student that maybe hasn't reached out to you or a student that you have so much context and so much understanding about their um, circumstances or the way they've navigated school um, and you want to write that letter for them, feel free to do that. I think it's really helpful, especially with, um, you know, not all uh, nonprofits are built the same. Some have um cohorts from ninth grade upward um, or even younger some get to interact with their um nonprofit cohort of scholars right at 12th grade and they're still kind of getting to learn about them even having information about what style of programming your cbo um, does or engages in is helpful so if you're feeling like i really want to do every student justice then Think about that letter as kind of like a school profile where you get to talk to us a little bit more about your nonprofit organization and what your program does um, for students and maybe what they don't do for students. Um, but if you're really thinking there are a couple of kids that I really want to write letters for and how, how do I decide, um, I... I, you know, I always say go, go with your gut. If you um, talk to that student and say, I'd really like to write a letter for you, um, I think that that would, would be great to include. Now, I know that our, um, and actually some, something that Jordan had spoken about is kind of the way that we're trying to corral the supplemental letters. I guess I, um, and Jordan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of see the CBO letter in particular as sort of a companion letter to the counselor letter um, because of the way that the programming works and then the way that they work with those students. They're not teaching students in an academic setting, but they are counseling the students in their college search process. Um, so submit. I, I will not say don't submit. Definitely submit if you feel that's appropriate. I don't know what else is in the chat. So. There's there are a few questions actually about alumni interviews. And what I will tell you is that this is an exciting change for this year is that we are and actually no longer offering alumni interviews, but we are offering alumni conversations. I know. Um, but truly, the, the, the change from interview to conversation is really meant to reflect the reality that since cycle year 2020, our application volume, of course, continues to grow and our alumni arsenal of volunteers is only so large and our ability, while, you know, we used to be able to meet almost 100% of applicants by offering them the opportunity for a meeting with an alum, we, alumni, we are no longer able to do that. And so because we have fallen way out of the ability to offer these to all applicants, the role in our process has greatly changed. And so they're not evaluative. These are not things that are evaluated given a rating, given a sort of summative, like kind of um, assessment even. All that happens is that in the conversation, there is a write up that happens that is just a basic kind of, you know, we talked about this, they shared this, that was the end. Um, and that gets added to a student's application and it becomes almost like a supplement, right? That it's not part of our required material. It's completely optional. Students actually even have the ability to opt out of it on the pen supplement this year if they don't want to be automatically passed on for the opportunity for an alumni conversation. It's the kind of thing where it never adds um, detractive information and it like rarely adds anything that wasn't already a trend or you know contained in the application. But the opportunity for a student to actually learn more about Penn, get their Penn questions answered, as well as share information in a bit of a different format if they feel that it's a better you know, 
platform for them. That's 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 what these conversations are there for. So we don't have interviews. They no longer have that kind of like hard line of questioning. They are no longer something that we're striving to try to get to as many students as possible. It really is something that's there. It's optional. It's not something that we wait for, that we look for, that we expect. And it really could be seen as something that's kind of just more like a supplement. We will be trying to also where we can, where we have to make tough decisions, right? We will try to reach students who are attending public institutions or schools that have like higher um, percentages of free and reduced price lunch or lower percentages of students who are going on to college to kind of respond to the places where students are least likely to be able to get their pen questions answered. But, um, you know, uh, really, this is a, a shift that I'm sure it's going to be one that continues in, in, in years to come to just respond to the reality is that this never had a large role in our process, and it has an even shrinking role, particularly because of the volume and our inability to offer this to everyone. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to note the time, and it does seem like we might have answered most of the questions related to the letter writing portion. Um, so uh, I want to get to the connect with this slide. Let's see if it'll let me. Huzzah, it let me. Um, do connect with us. I'm realizing I'm rep rep that's repetitive now, but. I do think our virtual offerings are really awesome and not just because we're here together in our virtual world and <laughs> you're learning something potentially new today, uh, but we offer a lot of other events um, that are geared towards um, the school community, um, not just student community. So uh, our website will have more information about that. Um, our YouTube page I've got to hype it up because it is really, really stellar. A lot of presentations similar in content to this are uploaded on our YouTube page. They may be a year or two old, but the content can be really helpful for different audiences. We have sessions related to um, international students and how they can approach the application process. We have sessions on um, specifically how teachers can organize their letters um, better. We have sessions that are related to different um, cultural resource centers that we have on campus. So all of these things can be helpful both for the counselors and the teachers in the room here today, as well as great to point your students towards um, if they're wondering, you know, what is it about Penn that I should be learning more about and seeing if this community fits what I'm interested in. Um, so hyping up the YouTube page and certainly our other social media platforms as well. Um, as I mentioned, we have many virtual programs that we're offering for different audiences. So please um, look forward to that. Also invite your students. Um, two that are coming up uh, this month. Uh, one is a uh, first gen excellence uh, student panel, which is gonna be happening next week on August 10th. And then we're also doing a, a virtual program that is uh, focused on Black and Latinx uh, Greek life at Penn. And that is gonna be on August 17th, if that is of interest to you or your students, make sure they sign up. Um, and with that, that's the end of our presentation. Thanks so much for bearing with us with all the technical issues that we had um, in the beginning. And as I mentioned, um, this presentation is going to be recorded. We're still figuring out exactly where to place it, but I'm going to bet the YouTube page might be a, a place it might go. Um, and if anything, there are plenty of resources um, on our social media and on our website for you to uh, tap into and share with other people who might be interested in uh, this content. So thanks so much, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day.